first order of business will be an opportunity for public comment. I understand you're here, sir. Yes. Would you please Stand introduce yourself? Yeah. Your name. My name is John Christowski. I live in Florence. My concern is these two two days a month for recycling grass and leaves is not enough. It's, uh, it should be in the summer you're in your prime time of grass cutting. I got four and a half barrels. I got to hold on to that till the end of the month. And it stinks. And it's, you know, there's bugs in it. You, you can see them fly in and out. And so if you can open up the landfill recycling for one day a week, just for the summer months to get rid of this, you know, the guy across the street, he's got a pile of grass that high and you can smell it every now and then. So if it was open every Saturday, would that? that yeah. That'd be a, a big help for the residents. It really would be because there's a lot of, a lot of people. They just hold on to their grass. One guy said, "I'm going to start dumping it in the roll. Let the city pick it up." <laughs> so that's that's my concern. Council. Yeah, thank you. Um, what he is saying is true. I, Ned had received an email from one of my residents also on Acrebrook. And Ned did reply back immediately. He works on the weekends also in the restaurant business and is having difficulties because he cannot get to that area to drop off his shrubs or his grass. John was telling me when he just went to the area to go ahead and do a dumping and blood about. I missed the first <laughs> Saturday. Mm -hmm. Right. That there's three people there. And he said one... The one was checking the stickers, the one was telling you where to dump your grass and leaves. And there's a sign they, there. And then they have the, well, you need the guy with the bucket loader to push the brush. You do need him. But if you can take one of those people out of there and put them on a following Saturday, you have signs there. It says uh, leaves and grass and brush. People have to read. <laughs> so there is a problem. As a counselor, I am getting many calls about this, okay. that it's very, very inconvenient. And I also am looking at a problem with mosquitoes. I mean, around Acrebrook and all that whole area, it is wet anyways. And I've been waiting because of all this rain, of hearing about flooding again on Austin Circle on that. But people are telling me that it's just not working. So if you could look at the staffing that's up there and maybe put one there and alternate even another Saturday mm -hmm. to open up the doors for the taxpayers and let them be able to do their job of cutting their grass and leaving it. And he is correct. Somebody has already called me today and told me if something's not done, they're going to start dumping on the street. And I'm not picking it up. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> I got enough of my own. Exactly. All right, John. We, we, but I um, thank you. We lost our, uh, the person within the department who would have managed that. Okay. And we lost her just around the time this conversation was happening. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if the conversation was quite finished before she was finished. Right. Uh, but we need to maybe circle back and look okay. at it again. Well, I think, excuse me, also with Debbie in the office, I hear such good things about her. And she knows about recycling and that, and I think she could pretty well manage saying, well, would you like to work this, this other Saturday? She is fantastic. I hear nothing but good about her. I was just wondering that if we decide to revisit this issue, whether uh, we want to think about um, expanding it to every Saturday, or if we want to look at um, a, a weekday every other week, that'd be um, nice for too. people for people who can't who can't make the weekend. Right. Uh, I wonder also if we want to put information on the website about mulching or linking up with farmers who would love to have some of this grass for for um, their uh, uh, for recycling. So that, that might be another option as well, just for education. Right, for educational purposes, but I know my ward. And once people cut, they want to know if they can get in there 
and go ahead and dispose oh, of no, it. Oh, no, no, I understand. I'm just trying to think. Yes, trying to think right. But it is a good idea, Rosemary. Yeah. But we are running into a problem. It's a, it's a staffing issue. Um, you know, the gatekeepers right now, we're short on gatekeepers right now on Saturdays, and we're having DPW staff substitute in uh, overtime rates rather than straight time rates. Mm -hmm. And um, it's when you start the leaf vents up there or yard waste, you need a bucket loader up there, you need a, an operator, and usually those are on tree crews or they're doing potholes or doing other work in the city. So it might be easier to do on a Saturday, but it comes at a premium cost versus okay. during the weekdays that people are doing other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the operations of the landfill were done by a private contractor for the past 12 or 13 years. Yeah. I'd be happy running. even with what she's saying. Just giving it on the Saturdays, I think that's opening the doors and people know that they don't have to worry about every or two Saturdays out of the month. And I don't want to keep coming in here with residents who are really getting upset. So I think if you could look at this very, very carefully, I would appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank, in. You, Thank you very Thank much. You. Nice meeting you. Okay, same here. Um, okay. Uh, Can I make a comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I made two trips down Hatfield Street today, or down yeah Hatfield Street, and at the bike crossing there, it's almost impossible to see people getting ready to come across the street because of bushes, because of shrubs and stuff. So I'm just looking at an accident waiting to happen. You know, if it's people aren't very cautious sometimes, or they start to make the move and then the car comes by there, and it's just this. Mm -hmm fraction of a second yeah. you're going to make a decision. And we have started our crosswalk painting at this point. So we're starting to paint the pavement again. Who trims the bushes? Um, typically it's done by the streets crews or we have the dedicated brush hog, side mounted brush hog that goes around and does the more rural areas of the city. Fill out a work order on that. I can take out a work order on that. Okay. okay. Any other public comments? <clears throat> All right, uh, next for your uh, consideration, the minutes of the May 22nd meeting. Are we being recorded tonight? <gasps> I believe we are. <laughs> Who's recording? Craig Odgers from North Street Neighborhood Association. Thank you, Craig. You're quite welcome. Um, I move approval of the minutes. Okay. Second. Any comments? Have you all? I passed on. Minor comment. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, all in favor of accepting those uh, updated moment, minutes? Moments? Aye. 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 Uh, we need to set a date for a claims committee meeting for 350 Ryan Road. Um, here it is, mid June. I wonder if we should take a second and think about our summer meeting schedule. In July, we would normally be 10 and 24, 10th and 24. Mm -hmm. no, so we're not talking about June 26th at this point? No. Uh, we could. I won't be here. I won't be here. I won't be here either. Mike. Oh. That would be excellent. <laughs> Mike. Yes. I won't be here. Just kidding. <laughs> One, two, three. We don't know about MJ. No, no, we're, talk we're talking about a... Uh, claims a claims committee. Yeah, no, but I'm talking about the... I won't yeah. be here. So, I, it was, I was sort of thinking about this, wondering if it was off the table. Oh, so so the 26 may may be may a problematic be altogether. Yes. yes. That's an aside. But, uh, so three, four people... Money if you're looking for something you left behind. Oh, yeah. You'll need that. So four people out of seven, that's not a quorum. This is four, four, will, four will be gone. Oh. oh. Wait, who's no, really, gone, really. gone, 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 and Mike no, is gone. No, was Mike is kidding. I was kidding. Yeah. Oh, you're kidding? Yeah. He just didn't know I read But I'm tempted to be gone he, if yeah. that's all that's left. <laughs> there, there is a chance if it's raining, I will be here. Oh, oh that's okay. I'm supposed to go backpacking Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh -huh. Well, we certainly don't it's have It's developing this. quickly, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, we should. We certainly shouldn't schedule the claim for them. Okay. Now, looking at July. It's okay because we just got it in. So. Okay. I mean, oh, okay. You know, so All right. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. Looking at July, we're, we're tentatively scheduled to have meetings on the tenth and the twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to do both? Can we? Do you have any reason why? Uh, the only thing I can think of is keep moving through private ways. We're going to have one more meeting in July on the uh, Saturday yeah. to finish up the last six, I believe we have at this point. Mm -hmm. We have petitions in place for them all. It's a matter of setting a date for that. I think we get through this Saturday first for the mm -hmm. seven private ways we have scheduled for Saturday. And mm -hmm. Maybe at the meeting on the 26th, I think it is. But we're not going to have it on the 26th. So we might have to do private ways on the 10th, on the 10th uh, for review, but not for, not for public hearing. Right. So if we don't set the next public hearing for the July event, it's going to push those into August, right. just so you're aware of that. Right. Well, we also have that hearing on the ones that we reviewed this week. And well, we normally would we would do the 26th. Right, right. But we could do that on the 10th. Yeah, yeah. As long as you tell them. Right. And, and we can schedule the July hearings. We, we need about three weeks' notice okay. to be able to do the certified mails. All right, so have we agreed no meeting on the 26th? I think so. Well, three of us have. Yeah, okay. Maybe. July as, as it normally would be scheduled. On the 10th. Yeah. And a plan to do the public way decisions on that day. Okay. I mean, just so you can tell that to people this weekend. I won't be able to do for the, for the private ways decisions okay. either. So you want to schedule the, um, the, claim, this, the claim on the 10th of July? Is that right with me? Okay. 10th of July. Uh, okay, contract for gaseous chlorine to uh, JCI Jones Chemical in the amount of $33,000. Move approval. Second. Um, we had two bids on this. This is the annual contract for the wastewater treatment plant for chlorination of the wastewater prior to discharge. Um, we had two quotes, slack chemical at $899.48 a ton and JCI Jones at $750 per ton. And it's the same price as we had last year. All in favor of approving that contract? Aye. Aye. Next, the contract for sodium hydroxide, the slack chemical, in the amount of $13,400. Move <laughs> approval. Uh, this is used in odor control at the wastewater treatment plant. We have four quotes ranging from $1.53.9 to a high of $3.23.54 per gallon. And last year's price was approximately three cents less. So it's risen a little bit. And this once again is the yearly supply for the wastewater treatment plant. Have we done business with Black Chemical? Yes, we have. So what does a sodium hydroxide do to the rotten egg smell? Or the methane smell? You would have to ask me that. <laughs> it's the combination of the sodium hypochlorite and the sodium hydroxide is used to control odor. I don't know exactly how it works, Terry. Okay. Just want, I just, just that general. was not a trick question. I just wanted. <laughs> I don't know the process of how yeah. it works. If you want, I can have, um, I can find out and report back to the next meeting if you'd like. No, no, you probably have enough on your plate. I just, it was just an idle question. Um, any questions about this contract? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. Uh, Next, the uh, contract for sodium hypochlorite to slack chemical again in, in an amount not to exceed 24900 So once again, this is the annual supply we need for poor order control to wastewater treatment plant. Low bid was 89.8 cents per gallon. The high bid was $3.16.2 cents per gallon. And last year's 
was quite a bit higher, almost double. Last year it was $1.57 a gallon, and this year being a little less than 90 cents. So. Questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, okay, contract for slab removal and mold re remediation and, uh, in the mechanic bay to F.A. Machete and Sons in the amount of 35700 approval. Second. In lieu of uh, building a new public works complex, we've decided that at a minimum what we would do is uh, remediate the mold that exists in the mechanics bay. And uh, this contract is... Um, involves the removal of a uh, slab section in the mechanics bay and mitigation of mold and the reconstruction of the uh, of the concrete slab would be done by uh, people on the highway project. So some of the work we're doing that we can handle and uh, this company is going to do um, the demolition of the slab and the remediation of the mold. We've received three bids for this project. Um, the low bid uh, is 35700 the high bidder was $50,225. And am I right? We're removing the slab because the lift is broken? We're not, we're not cutting the slab open because of the mold, are yes, we? Are. So the lift works fine. Wasn't it broken for a while? It was. But the remediation of the mold has nothing to do with that. So this is all about the mold? It is all about the mold. It was discovered when um, the um, lift, uh, lift broke. Yeah. Uh, the, the, or the collapse of the floor? The yeah. collapse of the floor was what prompted it, and so we had a company come in and do ground penetrating radar over the slabs and determine where all the voids were underneath the concrete slabs. These are all the voids that are underneath the mechanics area that is full of mold, I mean really full of mold. Uh, the area underneath the other part of the storage area was something you could take care of because there was no mold to remediate. So we found out where those voids were and received an appropriation from city council and we cut those slabs out and we did that work ourselves. Oh, right, that's right, that's right. So there's two separate projects in the same facility. But the floor didn't collapse on the mechanics side. Did not, but however, the thicknesses were similar to the ones in the storage area, and there was concerns that, especially during a snow and ice operation, when a truck comes in there with a plow with a full load of sand on board for a repair, mm -hmm. that it might collapse through the floor. The mold sampling that we had done um, as part of a study when the floor, when, when the floor did fail uh, revealed that it's a worker safety issue with the mold. So if it was just something below the slab that wasn't doing any harm, then we probably wouldn't be spending money to deal with it, but because the sampling indicated potential worker safety issues, we really had right. no option of doing that. Um, what do we know about the, the contractor? We know that they're a demolition company, um, and we, we did do some calls to check references, and the references came through pretty solid. Uh, we did quiz them about their intention on sort of means and methods because from our perspective it's a little bit of a, you know, do a lot of mold remediation type work. So we did speak with them uh, about their approach and approaches and we seem to have a good handle on the scope of what we've done. Where are they from? They're from, that's a good question. They're from Templeton. And where does the money come from? Where does the money come from? <laughs> the money comes from the mayor's That's next to it. <laughs> There was appropriations, two different appropriations for the work. There was appropriations for the storage area of, I believe, $40,000, and there was a $65,000 appropriation from the city council for the mechanics area. I assume it came from cash. I'm just curious about um, mold remediation, generally speaking. I mean, Obviously, it's a situation where we haven't been monitoring the space, so we don't know what period of time it's had to build up. But do we do we have a, a program as either part of this contract or something we might want to think about about monitoring mold development in the future so we can avoid this? Yeah, I think the plan is to uh, is to backfill the space, so uh -huh. we're going to pump the water out, mitigate the mold, and then put flowable film there to sort of seal the space from accumulating water. 
and then build a new uh, concrete slab over that. So that should kind of rectify the problem in the future. The mold has been there like forever. If yeah. You talk to, if you talk to guys in the, in the streets department, I mean, years. I'm sure that's I'm sure that's true. I'm just do we do you, again having no experience in this? Do you do you put a peephole in there or something? A mon mm -hmm. some sort of monitoring system, or are 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 we? semi-confident that by filling it up we're just going to eliminate the, the, the potential for new growth. That's what we're talking about. Okay. So is the filling and concrete slab going to be done in-house like we did the other? Yeah, it will be. Okay. Okay. All in favor of approving this contract for slab removal? Aye. 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 <coughs> Next, the big Hello, one. Jerry? Yes. I'm looking at the contract for Sodium hydroxide and the and the dollar amount in the contract is different than the vote. Really? Or it one? seems to me that it's different. Sodium hydroxide. What does it say? It says twenty three thousand eighty five. It says what? Twenty three thousand eighty five. As what? opposed to thirteen thousand four seventy. Look at you, Mike. Oh, man, you are the best. Because I'm a bit one, too. Should we amend our vote? I think you need to. Cool. Uh, she has a broken foot. Take it easy. I do. <laughs> A crushed foot. A crushed foot. <laughs> Should we go back to item number three? If you want to think about it and come circle back later. Sure. Yeah, let me come look at my Let's talk about one of Okay. Well, the next thing for your consideration <laughs> is a, a closure contract of a phase four. For phase four, to Jay Bateson, on the amount of one million two hundred forty thousand dollars. <coughs> this is um, a closure contract for the final capping piece um, at the landfill. We received seven bids um, that ranged from uh, the low, which is with Jay Bates, from one uh, one million two hundred thirty-six thousand eight hundred seventeen. The high bid was Jay JJ Maximilian at two million. Uh, $44,234. Um, we received a number of bids that were less than $1.5 million, so we felt it was a very competitive bidding situation. Um, we received a number of bids from all the firms who were good with landfill closure experience, so we were happy with the bidding environment and the low bid. Um, Jay Bates is a company that we've done work with, and we're confident in their ability to do the job. We were pleased with the low, actually, so all went pretty well from, from that standpoint. So that's a lot of difference. I mean, so most of them were under 1.5 million, but um, that the difference between the low and the high is there. I mean, on J Bank ends up local. Is there a reason to attribute why theirs is so much lower? Um, I think the question is why is Maximilian so much higher? Okay. Uh, because there's only one uh, out there. I can read a couple of numbers here for you. Uh, David Roach and Sons was 1.35 million. ETL Corp was 1.42 million. Gagler Ducci Construction was 1.45 million. North, uh, Northern Construction was 1.6 million. Clayton Davenport was 1.67 million. So the spread was pretty, I mean, it was pretty tight. I think we were generally pretty pleased with the way they came in. Yeah. Um, and we've worked with a number of these companies, so we feel like they know what they're doing. So this project will cover the only open face or semi-open face of the landfill remaining. That is true. And we have about five or six million dollars set aside for closure in the next 30 years. We have a financial assurance mechanism. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I believe the 30-year post-closure is in the order of 1.6 or 1.7 million dollars that we set aside. We have this money set aside, and we also had debt service going forward until 2017 that we need to cover. That's all rolled into the financial assurance mechanism. Okay. 
I think these bids came in line with, with our planning, low, lower yep. than our planning levels for the cap and construction project, but it's a good point. We are keeping a close look on, you know, on the financial assurance mechanism, the amount of money that's in there. Uh, but so far, rate. this fits nicely into what we had set aside. Yes, ma'am. And the work's going to be done this construction season? Yeah. Be done by October. How do they cover I mean, do they use dirt or maybe chemicals? Or there will be field trips and samples and photographs in the process. We could have a meeting there in the picnic That's area. A great oh, idea. Right. <laughs> each, each phase of the landfill has been capped with um, 40, 40 mil thickness like that, high density polyethylene. Plastic, so a gene membrane is the technical term for it, and that's covered with sand and topsoil and then seed, hydro seeded to get the grass to grow. So, um, and under the plastic layer, there's a sand layer that's used for gas collection. So it's sort of a multi-layer thing that they that they install. It all gets seeded by the fall, so we can get some grass to grow before the winter. So, is there a, a gas collector in that area, like? Or is that feed in the Amoresco gas? It will feed in. Um, there are some additional gas well extraction wells that will be installed as part of the collection project. I think there's four, if I'm not mistaken, four main wells. And those will be connected by piping to the gas system that goes to Amoresco and it goes to Lake Claire. Will this company do that or will? They will. Oh, okay. It'll be part of this contract. The, the well drilling itself is a specialty work. They'll sub that out to a drilling company. Um, all in favor of approving the contract for a landfill closure? Aye. 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 Um, <coughs> Ned, would you, I think, I think it'd be great if you could, um, at your convenience, next meeting, meeting after that, whatever, um, just walk us through the remainder of the post-closure expenses we're kind of expending. Mm -hmm. Our intentions, our, our, our planning, what our planning is. That fine. Do you also want to discuss properties that we own out there too as part of that future planning process? Yeah, actually, that'd be good. Thing. Somewhere, this is about the right time we ought to kind of review that. That's right. That, the last time we had this conversation, uh, I remember correctly, the board wanted to have the landfill closed and done with before mm -hmm. we made those decisions about the ancillary properties that we purchased or current or own before. Right. Recent times, so we can do that. Yeah, we can start with the uh, the initial part, to look at the projections, and then maybe that'll lead into the see what's the property there. Well, I wasn't around for that discussion, so I don't even know how much property we actually own. We bought a properties there we are. bought a land from a guy named Fedora that's adjacent to the landfill. But, so let, let's start with the, the money piece sure. and see what that leads. Can do. Terry, do you want to go back to sodium hydroxide? I'd love Mr. to. Mr. Parsons, once again, is totally correct. Ooh. My contracts are all correct, but I made a mistake on the agenda, and I don't know where I got that. Oh, so the 13-4 is the wrong number? The 24,000 yes. is? Yeah, the contract is all correct, but Good. I, I don't know where I got that number. I wanted it to be. And were the other bids more in the $24,000 range? Yeah. Yeah, he's got the big range. Does, does he? Yes, he does. Last page. I move that we reconsider item number three. Second. Second. All in favor of reconsideration? Aye. Aye. <coughs> uh, okay, would someone like to. Uh, I'll make what, a I'll what's make the motion? I move that we uh, award the contract for sodium hydroxide to the Slack Chemical Company in the amount of. $23,085. Second. And uh, are the uh, the other bids in, uh, more in that range? Yes. Yes. Uh, one's at $26,000, one's at $36,000, and one's at $48,000. All good? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, contract for North Elm Street and Sheldon Field Sidewalks to Salt Marsh Industries in the amount of $91,000. Mr. 
Second. This is uh, money that's been set aside for a few years from capital improvements. Uh, this is our last high priority sidewalk that we have funds for. It came down from traffic and uh, parking commission a number of, transportation parking commission a number of years ago. Uh, this uh, contract goes from Hatfield Street up to Bridge Road along St. Mary's Cemetery. So it provides another critical link to the rail trail and to Bridge Road and for students. So um, it's a uh, this is a low bid of $91,325. Um, How much was that again? Do you have other bidders? A bid record on this? $91,000. $91, I know, he said $325. $200. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is it Chapter 90 money? It is capital improvements money from the city. Um, we were awarded about $200,000 over a two-year period, and this is the last of money that we'll be spending on that until we get more money from the city again. Uh, we had um, eight bidders on the project, ranging from a high of $129,500, oh, excuse me, $131,378 for a low bidder of $91,235. Ned, how do, how do we, and, and this is probably like the uh, hand wringing in Congress over the uh, the wire tapping or whatever that is. I mean, all of the those Congress people who are wringing their hands voted for the program. <laughs> so perhaps we have voted at some point in the past. I don't recall voting to do that sidewalk. Just broadly speaking, how do we? These sidewalks came out of the Transportation and Parking Commission as priority walks, sidewalks that should be done in the city. So there's nothing that the board established as a priority that came out of the Transportation Parking Commission. It's part of their um, the long-term visions of that committee. And with it, they listed a number of them. And so far, we've taken care of quite a few of them, like the Happy Street sidewalk from Route 9 here all the way up to Bridge Road. That was a priority sidewalk that was done with the capital improvements money. And like I said, this is the last of the funds that we have. We actually have about $70,000 remaining in that capital improvements, and we're, uh, uh, we're given the, the difference uh, through a sidewalk design fund that was done back, I think, in FY06 that Susan Wright said that will qualify for construction. So, no, the board didn't make the priority decisions, the Transportation Parking Commission did. And they picked those, side, those two sidewalks over all other projects, or? All, over, all other sidewalk projects. Sidewalk projects. There was a listing of, I believe, five high priority ones. The first one was actually the Jackson Street to the Gables Condominium Project. And that was done, I think, five or six years ago, maybe a little bit longer, within eight years ago. That was one of the first ones that was done. Uh, this Hatfield Street sidewalk connecting Route 9 with Bridge Road was another one. The sidewalks from the Fitzgerald Development Neighborhood Grandview, uh, Clare, Carolyn Street, up to the pedestrian light at North Maple Street Bridge Road was another one that came out of that funding. Uh, those are the, some of the top priority sidewalks that they had. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Sorry, the road is it on? Um, could you explain again where it's located? It is between uh, Hatfield Street and Bridge Road. It runs on the Meadowbrook side of or the the St. Mary's owns on both sides of it. Yeah. This is the side that doesn't have a stone wall, so it's the open grassy field that is currently used for burial. But I guess that would be the southerly side of North Elm Street. North Elm cuts between the side. Yes, that, that that's correct. Okay. So it borders Construction Services and Morrow's Garage and St. Mary's yeah. Cemetery on one side, yeah. and the other side is all St. Mary's Cemetery. And who Saltmarsh Industries? Do you know that? They are a company out of uh, Granville, Mass. Uh, Smith College had some difficulties dealing with them with their project. Um, we checked the references. Um, the references are fine for doing sidewalks. 
So, Gary, there's no reason to disqualify him for building the two the sidewalks. Uh, they completed the project. There were issues, but they completed the project. So. Thank you for that insight. Um, <laughs> this, this, this is a pretty straightforward project. Yeah, I know. Um, I, my question was more uh, just how do we pick those sidewalks? I, I wasn't thinking. Oh, no, I'm responding to Harry's. Yeah, I know. I know. I know you're coming from. So, like I said, the sidewalks are done through the Transportation Parking Commission, part of a longer vision of where we should provide, be providing pedestrian and access to the rail trails, things of that nature. Safe routes to schools, right. things of that and nature. The, and the, that pot of money was set aside for sidewalks. It was set aside, I believe, in FY06 and FY07 in the capital improvements. And because DPW has been designing these projects, they've just taken a little longer than we thought to get to them. Sure. But this is the last pot of money that we have. Expanding. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? All in favor of approving the contract to build these sidewalks? Aye. 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 Uh, change order number one to contract 144-13 to computer network support service or computer network support services to data founder in the amount of O O O. So we're in the process of transitioning from the data foundry to MIS to take over our network administration. Uh, the mayor has pushed hard for that. Um, I've always supported that the city should have a strong MIS department. And so what's happened with the data foundry is that we have money left over. The contract expires June 30th this year. We still have substantial money left over in the contract. There needs to be a transition between the data foundry, who's been here for over 20 years, running our systems to MIS. So we're asking that that pool of money remain, but his time uh, contract get extended for a six month period for this transition to happen. Any thoughts about that? All in favor of extending the contract? Aye. 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 Great. Old business. Terry, before we move on, can I, um, I, I, I meant to put this on the agenda, but um, didn't, didn't ask BJ to do it, but can I, you guys provide us any information um, on the 53 Gothic Street contract that we approved last week? Sure. Um, actually, the contractor is out there right now. Uh, they actually hooked up all the piping today, so it is flowing again. Uh, basically, that sewer line was installed by a private concern in 1877. We have very marginal records on it actually flow to what they call the open ditch or the King Street Brook. Uh, doing some research on it, uh, we have no easement on the property for it, and so we're working with the homeowners for that easement. We do have a right of entry to do all the work. Uh, the first uh, meetings of the sewer commissioners formed in 1888 that actually were addressing the open ditch and making sure that King Street Brook as they call it, was put in a pipe system rather than open flow through downtown Northampton. So what's happened in the past month or so, month and a half, we started having problems down in this particular line clogging um, and, and breaking down. Um, we videotaped as much as we could. It was PVC pipe down the driveway all the way up to the garage. And after that, it tipped out of sight and into water so we couldn't see what was there. Uh, during the excavation over the past day, we found out that that's where the PVC pipe stopped, and after that went to vitrified clay pipe and went underneath the garage. When they were removing the garage, there was a huge sinkhole underneath the slab of the garage where soils had migrated down through, breaking the pipe, and uh, that's what the cause of it. The pipe had collapsed, and that was the problem. So we've been lucky. We've been working with the, the owners of record of the property. Um, very nice to work with. We've actually removed the garage that was there and the concrete slab. All the new piping is in place. Uh, we have Alan Seawall, the city solicitor, working on a easement going forward at this point for us to maintain ownership. The pipe was actually installed to uh, go up to St. Michael's School, High School, which back at the turn of the century was some form of Catholic uh, school and church, is my understanding. So there's a long history behind it. Uh, we assumed ownership of it, mainly because all our lines on Gothic Street run into it also, and the fact that James House runs onto it, um, it's part of that system that feeds up into Center Court, and also to St. Michael's. 
interesting. Thanks. Masterful song. Yeah, I was just a little confused why we were tearing down a garage. The garage is right over the sewer line. <laughs> we looked at rerouting around it, and um, it the people were ready to take the garage down anyways because mm -hmm. it was falling in, and actually the concrete slab was buckling in on its own. So um, it's worked out well for us. The price was uh, competitive. The high bid, I think, was almost 50000 versus uh, the low bid was uh, 27 if I remember right. Yeah, something like that. Awesome. So the, the real work's done now. The hard work's done, and now it's a matter of re restoration of the property. So we're, build we're building another garage? We are not. We're not. We're leaving them a parking lot. Okay. Impervious su surface. <laughs> if... At some point in the future, we took more responsibility for the sewers on center court. Should there be a T or any work done before they gets all paved over? Mean in center court? Well, are we talking about a line that kind of goes to the east of center court and then down to Gothic? What happens? The line runs up from Gothic Street up through the James uh, House lot, and then it takes a right and goes over to St. Michael's. And at that point, it's, it's roughly behind the it's houses. It's behind the houses on Center Court. Now, if at some point in the future we did something about the sewage on Center Court, is that where we would want to run it to? We, If we were to do something on Center Court, yes, we'd run it to that line somewhere. And, and that's before a, we pave over the top of this pipe, would it be worth... This, this line is... Gothic to going towards King Street. Oh, okay. This section is going to be a whole different section. Okay. And it's about 55, 60 feet of pipe we're putting in. The homeowners asked, or the property owners asked, that we, we put an alternate out there for ductile iron pipe, which we did install, in case they might be able to build a slab on grade structure in the future. Okay. I was in the wrong part of the pipe. Thanks, he yep. for me. It's not so all in favor? Uh, no, 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 that was, no. Extra required. Yeah, yeah no, no. I just, just information. Yeah, I was just curious. I, I saw. I saw it said we were taking down a garage. And I was yeah. Kind of that in there, didn't you? yeah. All right. So private ways. Uh, let's see. We're gonna have another meeting on Saturday to look at eight, seven, seven, twenty-five <laughs> minutes each. Um, <laughs> Ned and I. Uh, Went to the city council now? meeting on Thursday. They had a, uh, it was an interesting format. They had a hearing on the budget. And our, my understanding is that the only thing the city council could do at this point to the budget is cut one of the line items or reduce it. It was the only option. But they let anyone who wanted to speak in reference to budget matters in general have as long as they wanted to speak. So as you can imagine, it turned into a marathon. And Ned and I never speak. Until about 10.30. And then, and then they, they tabled what they wanted us to talk about. But had they asked about it, we were going to say that, uh, as we talked about at the last meeting, we are going to say that the, our board is going to circle back to the, sit, the streets where we voted uh, to not recommend approval. And that sort of settled the matter in the sense that the city council at that point said, well, then why don't we just wait till you've made your final decisions, whatever they may be. And then, and then it sounds like they want to talk to us about those streets where we don't recommend approval. So they'll get the whole package at once, the final package of all well, the streets. Well, they're getting the ones that we recommend that they approve. They get them in little bits and pieces. For example, Graves Ave has the whole package has been assembled. There's a, a plot plan, the legal work is done, and that's being given to the city council for the next meeting on the 20th. Yeah. Of the other three that have been through the surveying process, are just about ready to go to the city council. So the ones that we recommend that they approve, are kind of Going they'll, they'll dribble right. forward as we have money for the surveying and the legal work. The ones that we felt didn't meet minimal standards to become a city street, I asked Ned to, instead of sending those over as they occur, to just sit on that pile. I mean, it's not a very big pile. It's 
from seven or eight streets, whatever it is. But um, right. let's, I thought, let's stop sending those in onesies and twosies mm -hmm. until we have a chance to circle back. Um, and I did, I've made no promises about what will, what will happen when we circle back. I think uh, we're going to get a lot of hard pushback about King Ave, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a few there maybe, I have to admit, are probably worth reconsideration. Um, yes? So, so here's my curiosity. Um, what about, there's only so much money that the city council has allocated for survey work. So let's say we have five completed the whole process, including the survey. Then we have another um, 16 that we've approved and that go forward, but they haven't been surveyed yet. And it may be a while before the city council allocates the money for that. Any thoughts on that? I mean, it's sort of like, it's, what it's, happens? It's that, they're, they're just as much in limbo as the ones that we said no to. Presumably, the fact that we have recommended approval will get them a pass as far as snow plowing next year. Um, and the city council, I mean, I think they understand they have to come up with the money. I have put in a request to the mayor for an additional $25,000 for survey work. Our original request was $50,000, and they gave us $23,800 the first round. So I haven't heard back from the mayor on that second request yet. Mm -hmm. Or how much, do you have any feeling for how many? Um, Way that would cover? Um, at the rate we're going, it is running three to four thousand per private way for the survey work. Um, I don't know what the legal work and where they're charging that to. And yeah, we haven't actually had to go out yet with right. uh, transits and polls. So far, they've been able to do it on paper. Oh, good. Actually, they have been out on the street just to oh, pick yeah. up features like sidewalks, any. Okay. Things to be found so that they can back the deeds into known okay. monumentation that they found in the field. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um, it's going to be a fun day Saturday. Okay. I think that's all we have. We're meeting here at 9? Yes. Okay. For, well, for actually, uh, our, our first hearing is at 9. Our first hearing is at 9, so and it is. Um, Hebert. Hebert. Think which Hebert. is off of South Street. Right. So we want to be there a quarter of it. Yep. We promptly. Okay. So eight forty five? Right. Um great. Not great that you won't be here. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh stormwater and flight flight control update. Um May 31st. Against, yes. Uh, we had, had originally set a May 31st deadline. Uh, as, as that approached, we realized that we weren't going to make it, but that we were very close. So um, we informed uh, City Council through Paul Spector that we were requesting additional uh, time. Um, I think we're scheduled to have, the short version is, uh, and then against all odds, we came to cons basically a consensus on what we wanted to present to the city council and the, and the joint and the joint commi uh, committee, um, and we're in the process of drafting language right now. And uh, uh, we broke it out. Uh, we had an outline for what it would look like at the last meeting. We broke out pieces of the writing. Um, we're going to present two basic basic options that. I think I think there's consensus around one of them, pretty much. Um, certainly, there's a majority around one of them. Um, but we're also presenting an alternative that I think actually sort of highlights. By doing so, we're going to highlight some of the issues that 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 that, that drew our attention during the process. Um, and drafts were due on Monday. I didn't get mine in until today. <laughs> Uh, and we'll be meeting tomorrow night to work through the draft language, um, just sort of like a first reading. Um, and I suspect that we'll have final final version within you know a week. So uh, against all odds.
had an interesting conversation about this with Jim Dostal the other day, and he was, he was actually very, very impressed by, by the, 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 the quality of work that, that the committee did. And I, I am too. Um, um, I think that there were some very hard-held beliefs that didn't necessarily all fit in the same room, but at, at, at virtually no time did we lose a sense of civility and, and, and willingness to compromise. I think it moved forward really quite. I was actually... It, it was, it was a very sort of encouraging exercise in, in local in local governance. Uh, really, really has been sort of a, a very positive outcome. Acknowledging up front that this is really the first step, that there are a lot of hard decisions that uh, need to be made <coughs> in a number of cases. The, the, the task force has basically said this is a political decision that we are not qualified, well, we're not empowered to make. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of discussion, and I'm fairly confident that um, some of the things that we hold to be sort of consensus points will, 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 not, will not have traction once it gets into the public domain. Um, but, you know, that's not my problem. <laughs> so, but all in all, I think, it was, I think it's been a pretty good process, and we're in the, we're, uh, do we have it? Is it July, what, 8th, 7th? 8th, 7th. We'll, we'll, we will be done. Um, now, I think that there's more work for task force members to do. Um, I don't know how, how that would happen, but I think that um, uh, certainly um, some of the people on the task force are, are going to, I think, gonna continue to be active in the process moving forward, even if only as private citizens. Um, but I think that there's a lot of... I, I think as a group we've learned an awful lot about this issue and there's and um, for the city council to have to sort of reinvent the wheel I think would be a waste of their time so I'm hopeful that they'll draw on us and one of the things that the report does the final report will do is provide a lot of information through appendices on on work that that the report itself I don't think is going to be 20 pages I think it's going to be less than that the appendices however I think may be somewhat lengthy um, so uh, there's going to be a lot of information for uh, readers to, to absorb. Um, and uh, my hope is that it's going to be, as soon as it's finalized, that it's going to be available electronically. Um, and then we're going to have to start doing some outreach as a group. Um, and this group, I think, is going to have to do some of it as well. So at some point, we may want to um, have Jim and Terry do a rethink. <laughs> For, for, for this for this group on exactly what's in it because I suspect we will be getting questions. Anything else that you guys want to add? I would just echo what Chris said. It is pretty impressive. At first I'm thinking, oh man, you know, the people are all over the map um, in terms of how they were approaching it, their, their what seemed to be their um, strongly held beliefs about it, and is the after a little bit of finding their way, everyone's contributing. Everyone is yeah. contributing. Yeah. I mean, so unlikely people are coming in with written proposals and options and and arguing in favor of those, even uh, when pushed in other directions. It, the whole thing was very kind of interesting to watch. Right? Very impressive. And Jim has done just amazing work. Um, Jim would be the man. Yeah, uh, it, we we. And, and Doug as well, um, because a lot of the work that needed to be done to put to put flesh on the bones that, that people brought in, um, who had good concepts but had no way of um, of doing the math, because that's not where the, their strength lies. Uh, Jim and Doug have have um, been. I, I mean, I don't know how much time it's taken out of their days, but it, they've been amazing in providing us with the kind of resource materials that we needed to, to move things forward. Um, and I hope that, I hope that uh, their work is acknowledged publicly because it's just been amazing. We couldn't have done it without it. Jim hasn't shaved in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> He's been that busy. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Chris. Yep. Thanks, uh, slope stabilization on Robert's Meadowbrook. This goes back to a few meetings ago when um, I was asked to try to find out uh, who has real ownership of the land below the uh, uh, lower Roberts Dam. As far as I can tell, there was a, there's supposed to be a transfer to the city council for recreational use, and uh, we went back in the records of the city council, and it did not happen. 
So, the water commissioners are the proud owners of the land in question, and I believe that this FEMA grant will be pending in the near future, so we need to come up with, I believe, about $120,000, 25% share for the repair and stabilization of that bank. It's estimated to be a $450,000 project. FEMA has a 75% reimbursable on this. So this is a section below Musampi Beach where it's kind of eroding toward that house. You've seen the picture on the slides. I, I just want to say, if I can, just for a sec, yep. going back to stormwater, uh, there's a great presentation oh, yeah. uh, at Bridge Street School during the big thunderstorm about 10 days ago. Set up by Fred... Fred Zimmer. Zimmer. Yep. And the Pioneer Valley... Something or other... Meadows Conservation Commission? Uh, Ward 3 Neighborhood Association, okay. which Fred is a member of. Very cool. The, uh, so the, the head engineer for Western Mass for the State, Army? State, for the region. For the region. Army Corps of Engineers came um, and talked to us about the levees. Uh, talked a little bit about the maintenance issues as he saw them. Um, in his mind, it's a system. Uh, it's... There are all sorts of ways that the system can be undermined. For example, tow drains that are clogged, roots going through it, that sort of thing. And he's, he's making the case for maintaining the levees. Uh, it was kind of interesting. We have, he thinks, the Cadillac of levees. I mean, like, there are features in our levee system that he's never seen anywhere. For example, below the physical plant, where it goes, where after it goes through Paradise Pond over the dam, under Route 66. From there down to Cahillanes, it's all stone, hand laid, well, hand laid, and they're not like slabs, like like slate pieces. Each one's five feet deep. They're like posts, and no, all we're seeing is the top of the post. Oh, he's never seen that anywhere. Occasionally, they'll they'll do that sort of thing around the high stress area, but just to do a big V, wow. never seen it anywhere in the U.S. Um, there are about. 25 communities in the state that have some kind of Army Corps of Engineer flood works. Uh, most of them are tiny compared to ours. Westfield, Springfield, Chicopee, Northampton, we've got some of the biggest ones anywhere in New England. Um, we also had one of the most expensive ones, uh, one of the more expensive ones. Uh, it was very, very interesting. You'll hear people say about this is going back to the stormwater, floodwater thing. Like, man, there are 351 communities in Massachusetts. Only eight have a stormwater fee. Why do we, and you've heard, you've heard this, why do we have to be number nine? Why couldn't we wait till we're like 100? Let 99 people, other communities figure it out. But only 25 communities in the state have the kind of flood works that we do. And if you look at how many of them have a stormwater fee, suddenly the, the numbers look a lot different. Um, so, And as I say, we have one of the more elaborate ones and one of the more expensive ones and one of the oldest of these flood works. So it's, it's kind of interesting. It gives an interesting perspective on the whole thing. Did he say anything, or did maybe they didn't have access to it, but I'm wondering if you could get access to it, but the dollar value of the damages from the 27, 36, and 38 flood, because I'm sure that was a big driver behind the, the I'm not sure that they would be the source of that kind of information. Well, I know, but uh, I would imagine you could even... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to get some sort of... Uh, essentially say to the public, well, if we didn't have this, you know, 84 was the last time that we had a significant flood that got the Connecticut River up above the fields, the meadows. I don't know if it would have affected downtown. But. Well, one of the things that they pointed out was that the reimbursement for damages is from FEMA, which is totally different, totally independent from the Corps of Engineers. And I, I left thinking, do we really understand how FEMA works? Or should, how, what should we know about their request?
requirements before the flood instead of after. FEMA usually comes in after the fact with funds to help rebuild, fix, repair, so on. The programs that we're looking at right now are hazard mitigation grant programs to build, design, construct something in advance so that we don't have a repetitive loss or a new loss if we know something is marginal or could fail under a heavy rain event. So that's what those new programs are geared towards right now. As far as the Army Corps, the goal of that is if we lose our, our acceptable status, that will be no longer eligible for federal funds to rebuild our levy system if they were destroyed in a flood. That's where we lose if we if we don't come into certification and compliance with our levy system. Is after flooding events any damages would not be covered by the government. The Army guarantees the dike should be properly maintained. FEMA at some point would redraw the maps for where the hundred year flood line is and if they drew those maps as if there were no dikes, which is essentially what they're saying would happen, then uh, those 100-year flood lines would be well well into the neighborhoods down oh, in that yeah. part of the city. Oh, yeah. So all those mortgages that made technical default um, would be, it would be massive. Oh, impossible. Anyway, just uh, it was a pretty cool or, uh, yeah. presentation, I yeah. thought. And surprisingly well attended, I thought. Yeah. And I was able to extract the bust off my chest half the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy was laying into Ned pretty hard. And every time he was about to do it, he'd say, now this is nothing personal or something along those lines. Nothing but, under the bus, Ned, right. but. <laughs> so is everybody being held to the same standards we are? Yes. I mean, you look at the Hadley Dyke and you look at the Hatfield one. Those are shaking. agricultural dikes. Those, are not, the, those were not built by the Army. Yeah, as far as the army army is concerned, they, they do not exist. exist. Well, how do they get their flood their flood protection? They were lines from not from those. Those were built by the uh, State Department of Agriculture, probably to uh, reduce the chances of uh, soil erosion. Um, and as far as the Army Corps is concerned, the engineering standards by which they were built are a blank, total blank. The towns with those types of dikes, and those are most of the dikes in the state, towns with those types of dikes have the opportunity to come into compliance with the Army standards, but it's a fairly expensive process would require a fair amount of engineering work just to, to make the application. And most towns and communities aren't, aren't going. I just thought we were being discriminated against. No, no we, he, he, we he, have the Cadillac. Yeah, he, he said outright that he wouldn't he wouldn't touch those things because he has absolutely no idea what's going on underneath. No, I, so. I heard him. Oh, well, right. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so Robert's Meadow Dick, Brooke, are we we're good? Um, we don't have to make a decision tonight, but when the um, paperwork comes out, the decision has to be made in 120 days where the funding source for the money disappears to another project. And historically, it looks like the water department owns it? Yes. Purchased, I think, in 1871 or so. Well, that's a great opportunity to uh, spend some money. Um, okay, solid waste update. Uh, so, we'll await the paperwork? Is your yeah. We're waiting. Okay. Solid waste? So is that going to be, well, is it going to be reuse committee too? Or is there anything from the solid waste group? Well, we do have the public comment issue that was brought up. I don't know how we're going to deal with that. I don't, I don't know what vehicle that takes. I, I have to confess, I mean, it's just, you know, I don't even vote, but I mean, it's just one one thought, but there's, I can't, there's got to be a solution here. There is. Oh, and Jim knows what it is. I don't know a solution, but I will, I'll say I'm a resident, and I use the, you know I use all these facilities like everybody else. And I've got stuff sitting in my backyard, um, like this gentleman does. And you know it's a balance. I can look at obviously because I work here, you know I understand kind of both sides of the issue. So it's a it's a balance between convenience and cost. And uh, I think the schedule that was worked out was was based on 
our understanding of the cost structure and, and what would work within the confines of what we have. So, um, could we go back and look at it? It might make sense. I mean, you know, some people are, are inconvenienced, but you know, there's, there's another way to deal with it or not. It's an additional cost to the enterprise system. And this is our trying year of whether or not the enterprise fund makes it or not. No. This is this is a year that we don't know what's going to happen. I think we have a good handle on it, but right. we'll have a better handle in August next year. Animate is the wrong your, word, but you're sticking to your guns that there's that it would not work to have the heavy equipment operator do that work at some point during the week. They're doing other work. The heavy equipment operator at SMEO for the solid waste division is driving trucks with trash and recyclables around. And the other SMEOs, have special equipment operators, are doing work related on streets and trees. And if we did it, we'd have to take them off that. And we fur fall further behind in the work that we can't keep up with now. The person who emailed, excuse me. What? The, the person who emailed me earlier in the week, I strongly suggested that he buy a composter from us at cost and start composting in his backyard and enrich his gardens and his lawn with it. How'd that go over? He didn't respond. Well, and that's sort of along the lines of what, what occurs to me. It's, it's, there, there are behaviors or practices that you can undertake that don't generate a lot of waste clippings. You know, I'm, I'm big for growing grass, and um, I rarely pick up the clippings. You never pick up the clippings. And, um, and I think it, you know, some of us have a luxury of being able to mow more frequently, maybe, and so that's why it's not such a big issue. If, if you get stuck and, and you miss your mowing day and you have to wait another week, and then you're, mm -hmm. then you're buried in clippings, and then you don't have a, a choice. But I think a lot of this could be solved if people, apparently, some people pick up their clippings automatically every time, and um, I don't think you need to do that. But I don't know that the answer to this is to try to get people that have been mowing their lawns one particular way for a long time to try to change their behavior. So. Sounds like an uphill. Yeah, yeah right. And I'm not sure I want somebody to come tell me how to mow my grass either. But yeah. on the other hand, if it costs us money to open it up more Saturdays, that's, that's a... I mean, we have to balance those issues. Especially when there's other yeah, other options for doing this and that people, would, our, much of our work is about changing behavior, recycling, water use, putting, putting changes on the, you know, you, the water tarp was giving out um, apparatus to change your toilet flushing. I mean, there's a lot of different ways where we are about changing behavior because the future of the planet is in our hands, and um, there are ways to do it. So. Okay. I'm curious about what happens to the the stuff that piles up. We, so we compost, we compost the waste that we collect. Or right, go somewhere else. No, currently the compost that we create is used in capping projects at the landfill yeah. to amend the soils so yeah. that we have better organic content. Yeah. Going forward, after the landfill closes and all the capping work is done, we'll have compost. And we haven't decided what the end result of that's going to be. Well, I, I thought you, the idea you brought up is on like a third party farm, um, whether we collect it or they collect it or it goes from our collection to them or right. it goes, we are a collection site and a farmer comes and removes it. It, you know, it's just, and I think helping people understand that if they uh, collect leaves and grass, you put the two together, it's amazing what happens. Mm -hmm. it, it gets reduced very fast, and I would say it's very close to odorless. It's, if you're composting and you're doing it right, it's, it doesn't really smell bad. But the behavior change in it, it takes time.
Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, I live right across from where everyone's driving in to drop off their leaves. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it runs very smoothly. I mean, it just, the cars move in and out. I mean, the, I think the first week there was a bit of a backup. But other than that, I, I, I'm there and I see and it runs smoothly. I've talked to the gatekeepers and there's sometimes people complain and they say, hey, the city doesn't even have to offer any of this to you. And the people go, yeah, you're right. And then they're kind of happy. So... I don't know. It just seems like it runs nicely. There seems like a lot of people get there, and I, I, I agree. I think that people need to compost more. We have two compost containers. We rotate each year, so we really get it nice and good, but it's important. So I just want to say I think it's doing a good job. <laughs> I'm just curious what the volume of the input is for a weekend. We're still trying it out. It's only been, I think, our second or third Saturday we've been open. So I don't know about the volumes personally, but we can look into that. I mean, a bucket loader can turn over a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And to have it there all day long just seems like overkill for people bringing it in by the barrel. Oh, they bring in a lot. I mean, but you know, you pay some just guy overtime for two hours instead of full time you for a whole day. staff person down. Oh, I, I'm agreeing with that, but the, Look at that. to have a heavy equipment operator there and the machine. The issue came up is whether or not we would find staff at noontime or 1 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon to come in for two or three hours. That was one of the issues that we were seeing, rather than starting at 7 and spending the day up there, and he can monitor <coughs> the pit also, make sure people are bringing in you know, pressure-treated timbers and painted wood, things like that. PJ? Um, we have been trying to recruit gatekeepers to work because we're short-staffed on Saturday mm -hmm. and we need the hours of 12 to 4. We cannot get anybody to work those hours. We put out ads and we're asking everybody. There's nobody that wants to come in on Saturday from 12 to 4. So the clerical staff has been working. Two of the girls have been working landfill shifts because we have no one else to cover. So they had to work every Saturday up there, which yeah. of course we're not going to continue, but I mean, it's a problem. I can't get anyone, I want to hire someone for four hours right. every other week. And if, if, if we were, I mean, I'm just, I don't mean to beat this to death, but if we were open like seven to one, would that simplify the? Well, we, we had actually had discussed that one board meeting, the issues is, was, was that the people that are doing their yard work on Saturday morning aren't going to be ready for noontime or a 1 o'clock close. We haven't tested that. I mean, what, didn't we used to be close at 12 or 1? We did. But you're open during the week. But we were open all week long. Yeah. That's right. People had some options. We were open 7 to 2.30. Monday well, I'll bet Friday. most people don't actually mow on Saturday. I mean, maybe they do, of course. Many people must, but... Would that, I mean, maybe we explore that? We can explore. We're certainly hearing from everyone. Not everyone, but. Actually, I've only heard from maybe four or five people. All the city councilors are from here. I've only heard from one city councilor. We've had a lot of people come in. Uh, you're going to receive another letter from someone that came in today complaining. It, it seems like one of our challenges is it's hard to find employees to come in for part of the day on the weekend. Right, but I, I, I suspect we could solve that by closing at one. Uh, I thought the issue was they weren't if they weren't going to get paid for a full day, they really didn't want to come in at all. Mm -hmm. That's not no. the issue? The okay. issue is, is coming in in the afternoon. It's, it's the afternoon. The so that they might be willing to come in for half a day and yeah. go home. I see. I suspect everyone would be happier, and I don't... I, everyone would be happier. <laughs> everyone? There could be Whoa. four or five people that might be real grumpy Whoa. because well, I, just to rival the four or five people that are grumpy now. <laughs> the only other way you could do it is, see you is, is you could put containers up above and have those being filled by residents and then whenever we have spare time, move those down to the pit, the 30 or 40 yard containers. The issue is, is that each container is about an investment of four or $5,000 in costs that we'd have to make that investment. And if there's bad things in the container? Well, there's no way to monitor what goes into it. Well, you, if That's, people yeah. are dumb, you, you, we always have a monitor up above mm -hmm. and a monitor down below. 
Right. If you consolidate it to one area, you'd have one monitor. Oh, gotcha, everything. gotcha, gotcha, yes. But the issue that. is, is buying containers, then being able to get them moved down below in a timely fashion and turn them into the uh, composting stream. Sell it to a farmer. Yes. I'm, I'm of the mind that, that um, it may be that it's the pattern change that have people upset and that if we allow it to sort of stay the course through a season, it, it's going to go away on its own. The people just are, as Mike was saying, they don't like being told how to, how to modify their behavior. But I think that was our plan. Yeah. I'd like to have she stick to it. Yeah. I, think, I think maybe what we ought to do is, um, you know, continue to um, solicit feedback for it and revisit it at the end of the season, but not do anything precipitous this go-round until we've, until we've seen it seen it in action for a year mm -hmm. and just that should be the, the, the sort of the policy which is we, we, we're, we're pleased to hear from you we're, we're acknowledging you know your your feedback and we're gonna we're gonna revisit this after we've had a year uh, uh, with it in place um, Are we ready to move on to reuse committee? No, I still want to argue for seven to one. All right, fine. <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. So, um, Susan Wade has, um, who is the Amherst um, reuse coordinator, is working for Northampton. She even has a Northampton um, address. She's been running the last two um, reuse committee meetings. She's fabulous. And um, all, all the things that we've been wanting to do for a long time, she's she's doing. That's nice to nice to see. She said today something I've been saying for a long time, which is that yes, we don't have a reuse facility, but we have all these reuse events, and they're really great. They're getting more, keeping more thing, more uh, items out of the landfill. They're achieving the same. They're achieving reuse. Um, the goal of reuse, which is a, a really good thing. So we're having these events. That's happened more over the years, and that um, it's sad that we don't have um, a reuse facility, but we are going to have a new slab in the building outside, which I'm happy about. So we, you, know, you just have to pick and choose what your battles are. But she was, she's very good, and so I don't know if she's temporary or permanent, but uh, I think it was a great choice. We are, we are working out details going forward on that. I don't have all the, I don't have it nailed down yet, but we're working on it, and uh, so far she's doing a great job for the city of Northampton, um, and uh, she's actually uh, gearing up for the event on the 22nd, even though she can't be here for it. She's coordinating that, that event coming up. What's the event on the 22nd? Uh, rigid Plastics, and it's also a pick and choose so that people come in with their their white buckets and and uh, so you can take the white buckets away but leave off your your big big wheel plastics and and you know so hopefully the last time we did this a year ago well I think we've done it other times but I was at the one a year ago and there was a lot of there wasn't a lot of uh, there's a lot of taking away of stuff so that was oh I was a big takeaway yeah. yeah. We did post it on the blog today, what's being accepted there, and uh, there's a press release that went out also today, right. all the media on it, and uh, Salvation Army were there doing textiles and household appliances, and um, the other one that's going to be there is... Bikes Not Bombs. Bikes Not Bombs. And Salvation Army for any leftovers, and uh, anyway, but thanks for coming to the meeting. Not a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, or last, um, there was an issue of my ego or my bags. I forget what it was. A group that wanted us to endorse this public, this private group, and the group, several uh, individual members have went forward with a letter to the mayor saying we want you to endorse, um, uh, uh, asking people not to use single-use plastic bags in stores. And he said he could not endorse, as we have said here, he could not endorse a, a private group, but he would be 
interested in, in um, uh, supporting the the uh, black the um, use the the disuse of single use plastic bags. So the group also wants to send to the Board of Public Works a letter, a very neutral letter, but that goes out to the community saying uh, we do not want to. Uh, we want to see the, the minimization of these single-use plastic bags. So it's not going to be in the packet for this meeting, but it'll be in the packet for the next meeting. So then you guys can, and we can all take a look at it and see if it's something that we want to do and have. It'd be very neutral. It's just that we're saying, hey, it's not use plastic bags. I mean, it's interesting that, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Let me raise my hand there. Um, there's already been a ton of things in the community regarding single-use bags. I mean, it's, it's been amazing of all the towns that kind of bust in on and, and sort of lecture people that they need to use single, not use single-use bags. It's kind of interesting because the, the bag share program that, that has been in town for a number of years and a number of uh, stores do their own bags, the little Cooper's Corner, for example, and others. They have bags with their own name. Downtown businesses have bags with their name, you know, that people can reuse. So it's been a great... Uh, Great effort by the business community to sort of support that. So mm -hmm. it's been a lot. I feel like there's been a lot done. I do too. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, when Jim Dostal was on city council, he was looking at producing or proposing an ordinance or a council resolution banning them in the community. And I don't think it gathered enough steam to go anywhere. So I know it's been discussed well for a number mm -hmm. of years at this point. Um. Okay. Uh, next is claims committee. I think it's the nope. legal document or the, le the proposal, Alan's proposal. Oh, yeah. yes, Alan's That's proposal. Um, so, Alan sits on the city's general claims committee with the city councilors downtown, and he placed up his memo dated May 7, 2013, in regards to looking at changing the way that claims committee does their work. <clears throat> and basically throwing it to or giving it to the insurance company to deal with. Alan's starting to suggest the same thing for us up here on the enterprise funds. Uh, there's nothing detailed in this memo that talks about the enterprise funds, but I did have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about that, and um, he's going to come back with some information for us for the board to consider going forward. I would say for myself only that It's basically water and sewer, and it's kind of a different thing. I mean, I, as we've often talked about, we feel like we're running a business, and these are people coming back for a refund, if you will, or, you know, they're coming back with a, a problem with our product. Um, it's usually fairly cordial. I, I don't, at the, at the moment, the way we, it works is, if it's a large claim, we give to the insurance company. But today we did one for 300 and one for 1,000. In both cases, it was basically a problem out in the street caused a problem for a homeowner. I think they both left feeling pretty good about us, Ned, the whole process. Uh, much different than just being said, oh, we're going to talk to the lawyer and we'll send it to an insurance agent. It's a great opportunity for public relations. I mean, it, plus we hear back about what a great staff you have and the public relations they've already done with a lot of these people. It's nice to hear that. Yeah. I would also say there's an opportunity to um, share what we do, right? So help educate them, they, and they educate us um, about infrastructure and what they ought to be doing and how they should use it and we get to say, you know, we, we want to provide this service and uh, we want them to understand how it works. I, I, I kind of like the fact that we are meeting the public and if they have a place to come and talk to people rather than just get a letter, a formal letter and say, we're planning to be processed. And the conversation we had today was a claim of for a thousand, eleven hundred dollars, whatever it was, is that, you know, they have this um, open plumbing thing in the basement, which is in the car, you would, your washing machine flows into a two trap, and you don't have a back water damper on it. And I think people just don't understand that that's really that would make a big difference. Just putting a back water damper on that 
dream could solve our problem. I wanted to know what the, if the staff felt it would save them a lot of time. I don't think it's a whole lot of time that we spend on it. There's some letter writing and some coordination, but it isn't um, 40 hours a week we're spending on it. It's a few hours here and there. If the claims committee and the board wants to keep that internal, I'll convey that to Alan. Um, I think he's also concerned about whether or not we're complying with Chapter 84 and Chapter 258 as to how we look at the claims and the timing of the claims and response to them. So I'll get that more information from him that also that we can discuss in the future meeting. So I think we like it the way it is. Okay. Well, we think we're doing good things both for the city yeah. and, for, and for the DPW. So well, this, this memo no was geared, excuse me, this memo was geared to the general claims team, right. not specifically sewer water, as part of the bigger conversation. <coughs> That's all. What, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, point ahead. of information, what other types of claims do, do we handle through that committee? Potholes are the biggest one. Uh -huh. uh, damage to tires and rims. Uh, mailboxes go through that committee, but it's really a voucher program to get a new mailbox during snow plowing operations. Trees falling on trees or limbs, not trees falling on trees, trees falling on cars or vehicles, limbs falling down, damaging fences, city trees, are the predominant ones that I see. And some medical claims from people falling? Trips and falls yeah. downtown. From tripping on sidewalks? I mean, I would, I would defer to my colleagues who actually do the claims as to their preference, but I actually see a fundamental difference between the work that you guys are doing and that. Those are acts of God. These are, these are things resulting from a system where they're paying into it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's I think that that's a different, a slightly different kettle of fish, that maybe requires uh, something other than an actuarial response. <laughs> so. um, Gary, anything we missed? I don't think so, but I, I'm I want you guys to know that I'm we're going to a meeting with this DEP in Springfield on the 10th of July to talk about. Um, adaptive management of Paradise Pond, which, in to their suggestion, would could mean that we don't have to dredge again. Yeah, it's interesting. I had a, a discussion with Nicole Sanford, our ACE staff scientist, about, about the issue, and uh, she brought up a pretty good point that the city is responsible for um, sediment management within the canal, so that. If there's a lot, of, if there's sediment being released by uh, at the Paradise Pond area into the canal, and that creates sediment pockets that need to be, we, the city is ultimately responsible for removing those shoals that, it, that exist. So it's it's kind of an interesting concept. Some of the some of the uh, things that the city has been cited for by the Army Corps is, is removal of some of the shoals in the canal. Mm -hmm. So the release of more sediment, I guess raises the question of will there be more shoal development and will there be more issues with sediment management further down the stream? Yeah. Do they care about shoals once it goes under Route 10? All the way down. Really? And sometimes, I mean, it, it, we haven't been that active in removing shoals because the, the permitting is pretty arduous in order to do that. And there actually have been shoals identified in the older core reports when they've subsequently come out and done their inspection, the shoals have been gone because we'll have a you know have a huge rain event or something and hurricane or whatever, and then some of the shoals will get you know the smaller ones and they get kind of blown out of there. Well, to address that particular concern, there's going to be a lot of study done, and um, it would include going down and surveying uh, the bathymetry beyond, or uh, at least two, but I think beyond the Route 10. Uh, Army Corps spillway that's under that, that bridge. And what um, what I noticed is that we have these great photographs of 1998. It was an absolute sandbar from, from the dam all the way to Route 66. That's all gone. And if you go down to the spillway under Route 10 and you stand upstream of it, you can see the bottom and it's not sand, it's rock. And you can see the rock. So 
I think that there's enough velocity there that it cleans itself. And I know there's shoals that appear. But at some point, the Army Corps is going to be part of this conversation. So uh, I don't know where it will go. But I, uh, on Monday, if you've never seen a shock boat, and I never have, there's going to be a shock boat in Paradise Pond, a state boat, and they're going to be inventorying fish. And I guess they nap them. And I don't know if it kills them or yeah. what. But it doesn't. they come to the surface of yeah. they can count, and then yeah. they... And they come out of their little thing and say, wow, I feel better now. Oh, he's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like he's changed. That's right. Clears the gills. And so it's, it's this, the uh, state fisheries guy. Well, I know what I'll be doing on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. It's Richard Hartman. With your net. <laughs> and he's going to go up and he's going to go How downstream as well. There's a lot of fish in there. Oh, there's a lot of fish. There's a study from 1973 and there was 15 species and this woman counted over 5,000. Fish. What happens when you when you get it? They go, they go away. upstream. Upstream? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Goodness. Smart fish. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't go upstream. Well, that's why you drink. Our dads and pond clams and such get eaten. Cold water fish do. Yeah. Speaking of which, the, the garden house pond looks beautiful. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, share with one of the more vocal members of the Sanderson Avenue um, community that we had voted to recommend to the city council that they be made a, a, a public way, and they were ecstatic. Did you talk to them about the medium we're going to put in? No, I didn't tell them that. <laughs> Um, regarding the CWMP, some of us, I forget what, who the subset, David, me, Gary, Gary. Um, is there a thought on when we might be convening to talk about those reports that we were given? Tim and I started that conversation this week, but we never finished okay. it. Okay. Soon, right? Soon. I'll make a note. Soon, soon would be good. Well, I okay. think chopping up a bit to, to move on some of the alternatives we're actually waiting for some input from us, so the time is good for it. Thanks for asking. Ned? I'm all set, thank all you. All set? Jim? Yeah. Summer vacations, anything you want to... <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll set. <laughs> yeah, I'm set. <coughs> My compliments on the... Uh, with the gas company did in front of the post office. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think about that. Ned, I about it. Ned hammered at them. And so I thought that was a rumble strip by design. <laughs> no. So I think they know our new standard that we're looking at moving forward when they do road cuts. <laughs> when, when will we see the, uh, the new policy? Next meeting. Sweet. Jim has been working on a policy which would explain uh, in advance to people like the gas company what our standards are for cutting these multiple holes in a row. Oh, that's already in place. Yeah, what I was going to yeah, what I was gonna bring forward was uh, was our inspection program. On, on oh, I thought they're all it was all one thing. No, no. I mean, uh, the new trench permit process. Actually, Nick knows more about it than I do, but the new trench permit process um, changed those requirements. So great. Yeah, and that's, being, that's being implemented now. Sure. All right, and, and that's good, the other. The inspection part, the double back. And so the, the language that we have now says that within five years we could go back to a contractor and ask them to repair something that hasn't worked out that well. But we've never actually checked, and that's what Jim's talking about. Nice. Yeah, we're looking at a, I believe it's a three-year check and then a five-year check just prior to the closure of that. And if there's a cost to that, we'll review the fee for a trash permit. Right? No? We'll do more with less, okay? I like that. Could be happy to raise all fees. Okay, great. Time to go. To adjourn. Oh. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Bye. Bye. Thank you, Richard.